All right. There we go. Oh, okay, and I have to consent to it. Great. Okay. Oh, you do? Oh, cool. Yeah, a little pop-up shows up. That's nice. Um, okay, so we're here to talk about um, the absent but implicit. Um, I know, you know, I, our, our relationship is, has, was, is predicated on me being a student in your class, right? And so it started there. It's, I think, you know, I, in, from where I'm sitting, it's expanded beyond that, but it, but, um, it has that in it. And so I um, kind of wanted to put that out there. And, and, and having said that, uh, I guess a good place to start is, so what's absent but implicit? <laughs> what, what does it mean? Well, um, for me, it's, uh, it, it's linked back to this notion that everything we do and everything we say um, has, you know, the secondary storyline thing, which is what we talk a lot about in narrative. And it's one of the things that's really important for me in talking about absent but implicit is to make a, a huge distinction between the idea of a secondary storyline and some like unconscious process. So like absent but implicit isn't that there's something that you mean by what you say that you don't know and I do. Absent but implicit is to say that somebody who's, um, who's screaming about something that they don't like is speaking about a knowledge that they have of an alternative. And um, you know the story that goes behind that, but I'm not gonna tell it because it's full of swears. <laughs> but the, the idea that, we're, that, that our actions, our explicit actions have something that's absent but implied by them, and that there are questions that we can ask that actually make those things explicit and by bringing those implicit things into an explicit context, we have a, a way to, you know, talk about how we're really psyched that we act in that way or really it links us to stuff that's larger. It may link us back to family members and, you know, those, all those questions that we can ask that kind of evolve that territory. But it was this huge thing that happened um, for me in, in learning about this work. And I can't remember, unfortunately, exactly where I heard about it, but I do, the only thing that I remember really specifically is that it was something that in my view was one of the last things that Michael White, who's one of the guys that started this whole narrative work thing was really excited about um, before he died. And, um, and it's been sort of a central focus for me for a long time because it has that capacity to, um, to bring forth stuff that's that's a more richer description. Uh, it's, a, it's a richer description of of um, kind of what we do, how we do, everything we do, and it started. And so then, so this COVID thing happened, and the idea, and people are responding to that, and people are responding in a way that you know they're trying to make a determination about whether or not, you know, am I just afraid or why, you know, what do we do and. And so the idea that there's something absent but implicit in everyone's response, like for example, you know, if you're gonna, so you're gonna make the choice to kind of quarantine yourself. Okay, so, you know, you're doing that because that's what you told them to do, but, but what's, what's absent but implicit in the context of that response? And so people can start to talk about, well, it's, you know, it's about me caring about myself and me not wanting to die and me caring about people around me and me thinking this is gonna contribute. And the thing about, about asking that kind of question is that not only does it put the, the it, it creates the possibility for that person to describe why they're doing what they're doing, but it illuminates more than just the I'm quarantining because I'm supposed to. And then there's this richer description of why they're doing what they're doing that then you can kind of sit back on and go, oh, so I'm, there's a lot of reasons why I'm quarantining and they're kind of connected to stuff that I'm kind of psyched about. And so then there's, so there's this sort of larger purpose to why I'm quarantining that has to do with me kind of actually having some power in relation to this thing that, you know, the virus, I have no power over this virus, but I have some power in how I respond. And then it starts to kind of, you know, we talk about kind of reposition us in relation to power and that it's not somebody outside of us that's making choices and telling us what to do all the time. Although sometimes that happens, but there's like, I'm literally manifesting something about what I stand for and everything I do. And, and that's pretty cool. And so then there's things that I stand for and what are those things and what have I been standing for and, and uh, what have I been holding dear, those kinds of questions that we talk about. And so all that stuff burbles up from this very simple idea that, um, that everything we do is a manifestation of the stuff that we stand for and what matters to us. So, so I, yeah, so, so kind of go back to something you said about um, 
so, uh, so secondary storylines and and you, and you so, so you seem to be contrasting um, secondary storylines and, and what's absent but implicit with what you call um, like subconscious processes which is like a I gather you know it's like a therapy psychology thing can you, can you tell me more about that distinction and um, and maybe why why making that distinction feels important to you well, it's, it's, it's really important to me because I believe that my experience is there's so much. So, you know, so I've been doing this therapy thing for a long time and I started off sort of from that psychodynamic perspective where there's these unconscious processes and we do this because blah, 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 blah. And, and what early on really started to drive me crazy about that is that it was positioning power someplace other than, than, with us. So the, the idea was that the, the person who had the authority to describe why I was doing what I was doing wasn't me. It was somebody who, you know, understood our subconscious, wah, 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 and that the, you know, and those interpretations. And I, you know, as a clinician early on, I was doing that. That was part of what I was doing was making these interpretations and talk to people about why they were doing what they're doing. And, and, um, and what this, what this, this distinction is about, asking questions and the thing that you know we talk about all the time this question of genuine curiosity i'm really curious about this about what's happening here and that what it says about maybe what what you're standing for what you know what this so that, and and the the uh we've talked about the why question a lot in the work but you know we've we've modified it kind of in this group to this you know what is it about this response that has it being the one that you're doing you know, what is it about this quarantining response that has it being the one that you're taking up? And, and, and so people are put in a position to kind of, you know, they can kind of consider like, oh, geez, hey, I don't know. And it's that kind of like, huh, I don't actually know kind of response that I love because then we're in this, because, you know, for me, the I don't know isn't I don't know. For me, it's about I've never been asked that question before. And now I'm kind of invited into this place of going, Wow, it's like it's like you. My wife talks about how she has dreams all the time of going into these houses and there's all these secret rooms that she didn't know about and how cool it is to find the secret rooms and all this thing. And it's like that. It's like, oh wow. So there's this there's this door here that's been in my house the whole time. I open it up and there's just like I don't know. There's like this cool sunroom in there that I've never been in before because because I've never because of the way that that we're invited to describe ourselves, we never looked over there. And all you have to you can go. And that, that's the other thing that, you know, it's not like that door wasn't there or I'm creating it or me as a therapist and somehow making this happen. I'm just going, well, is, is there a door in there? And they go, oh, yeah, there's one over there, <laughs> you know. And so hmm. invited into, into this territory of going, oh, so these, wow, these, I actually have access to all these descriptions. Nobody's just, nobody's ever asked me a question that kind of had me considering the possibility of looking for them. And so it's a, so that's the transition. It's like moving from a, I've got to go to some person who's going to fix me and help me understand things about myself that I don't understand to a, this is a conversation where we are in collaboration, where um, the, the, the difference between this conversation and the kind of regular conversation is that you are centered as the person I'm asking questions to but my curiosity is genuine and based on this, this idea of like this idea that there things are absent, but implicit in the things that we do. And I think the implicit thing is the, is the, the key thing because absent could go to the psychodynamic idea, the unconscious subconscious idea, but the implicit thing is like, Oh, well, you know, there's actually, there's something there. Um, and one of my actually students from this year came up with this uh, sort of the positive negative space thing. Like if I, if I show you this object, it's kind of a lame object because it's sort of square. All right, this is a better one. How about this object? So, so, you know, <laughs> we are, we are inherently indoctrinated into the idea that what you're looking at is this busted zip tie, right? But, right. but there is, if I asked you to draw the space around that zip tie, you'd be like, oh, mm. that's an interesting idea. Ultimately, when we're drawing the zip tie, we're doing that too. However, if you're focused on drawing the space around that zip tie, and like if I put it like this, and it be look at all the crap in my studio that's around that thing, right? But the idea, the idea that all that other stuff back there is also available to be described and be talked about, is, is this, and it's there. The thing about the absent thing is that there it is. It's actually there. Um, but if if nobody ever says, 
so so um so are those guitars and you go oh whoa hey wait a minute those are guitars and they're totally in the picture i'm saying you know draw the space around this oh there's three one of them's a banjo <laughs> <laughs> you know, and it's that, yeah. that's all that it is. It's not this magical, ooh, I made a banjo up here. It's right there yeah. and it's been there, but nobody ever said, is that a banjo? What is it about? And so what's, you know, like what's absent but implicit in this that you see right here? There's a freaking mandolin and a banjo and I don't know if you can see the ukulele over there, but there's, you know, mm -hmm. oh, there's a lot of instruments. So, so what does that say about, oh, it says, I play a lot of instruments, right? And, but there's no, if all you're focused on is the busted zip tie and ultimately, you know, metaphorically our culture is like, no, it's all about the busted zip tie, right? Then we never ask those questions. And what we do as narrative informed folks is we're like, cool busted zip tie. Is that a gong? <laughs> you know, am I still there? Okay. Yeah, so yeah, no, sorry, it was, there's a, there's a brief cutting out. No, so the abs okay, so the absent but implicit. So the the yeah, I, I hear in the distinction between absent but implicit and like subconscious processes or whatever has has to something has to do with uh, power, positions of power, and as well as sort of what's implied versus what has been to use another term projected or or maybe invented by the the, the therapistic person. So so putting in a <laughs> Putting this idea in a therapisty kind of context, I, I'm I'm curious what kinds of what kinds like how does the absent but implicit show up um, in in you know in more traditionally therapisty environments? So so if you're doing therapy work, how could how could absent but implicit either be used or show up or be helpful or or however? Well, so okay, so so one of my another example that I use when I talk about this is comes from the Maury Povic show, and I don't even know if that show is on anymore. But I need to heard this story. It, so for those who are watching this video, David's heard all these stories. <laughs> I'm just telling again because they're the stories I tell. But um, so the, so the Maury Povic show was this talk show, and he used to have this like marine-looking dude come on and scream and yell at people to try to make them change. And one of the, and I happened to be watching one time. Um, because it was on 56 and, you know, back in those days, there was only like two channels, but, um, and he, here's this Marine dude and he's, so he's screaming at this 11 year old kid. I think it was 11. I, probably his, his age probably changes every time I tell the story, but it was a, you know, young kid. And, um, and the idea, this kid had apparently been, um, very, um, abusive to his mom. And so, you know, Maury had sat down with the mom and the kid and, you know, blah, 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 it's a terrible story. And they showed some video from home where, you know, the kid was being awful and all this stuff. And so the next thing you get this Marine, you know, with his Marine hat, you know, screaming at this, at this. And as he's screaming at this little kid, the little kid literally says, I, I never, ever wanted to do that to my mom. But the Marine guy is so caught up in this, you know, he's got to yell at the kid that that statement just completely goes unheard. It, it was never addressed. Nobody ever came back to it. And I'm like, do what? So, so, so this kid who's being described as all he is, is a screamy, yelly, you know, hate my mom, scream at her, abuse her, is literally saying, I never wanted to do that. And, and it goes, it goes unheard. And so that's a huge, um, it's a huge opening to that secondary storyline. Um, in some ways, that's a, that's a, a more a description of stuff that, that that's actually explicit that doesn't get heard. Um, but so the, really the, the opening is the, the opening lies in I never wanted I never wanted to do that. Yeah. Okay. yeah. And so then you know so how so then so now we're like we're not now we're like we've moved from a this is a kid who does this all the time because it's kind of how he wants to be to a oh my god this kid didn't want to do this in the first place so how did that ever happen. And what does it say about what he stands for that he never wanted to do that in the first place? What does it say about what he's been hanging on to that he didn't never want to do this? And how has he been able to hang on to this in the face of, of all that's happened? Um, that and, and especially since, you know, this kid's been so dis described so frequently as this um, all all he is in is, is an abuser that he's on the freaking Maury Povich show. So, yeah. you know, this is a this is a pretty powerful context that's living in this kid's life. Um, and it, it, but it continues to be missed. And so, 
so so um and or so 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 the idea of the secondary storyline or the double listening these are kind of ideas that percolate a lot in the narrative therapy world and um and it's and it's con it's difficult because it's so countercultural. It, it's so easy, at least for me early on, it was so easy to think about this in that kind of psychodynamic, subconscious, unconscious kind of way, that it's difficult to kind of go, no, actually, it's that we're constantly walking around in this in this multiply storied kind of existence, but that the dominant culture allows us to be described only in certain ways. And so these other kind of possibilities um, are missed. And it just goes, it goes back to the, you know, the zip tie thing where we're about the zip tie and we're not about all these other things that exist at the same time. We're so focused on this, the, this object thing that we don't like take in everything that's possible. And so it's literally an invitation to like be considering because the, you know, the space, there's, there's an idea that I've never been able to really kind of clearly articulate, but there's something about, the busted zip tie that's also connected to all the other stuff that's in the room. And they're literally interacting spatially and energetically, you know, in the context of like physics together. And so they're yeah. literally kind of a manifestation of each other. Um, <clears throat> well, and, and that, and that relationship is, is often determined by, by the, you know, the frame through which you see it, the relationship would change if you, you shift to the frame. And that's why, and that's why, you know, Joe, so, you know, so this is pretty cool because I can actually do this. Um, Joe, would you, you so like your drama mean if you're watching this? Here we yeah, go. Sorry, I'll try to do it. So, like, if we're, if this is the focus, then all we're yeah. seeing is that guitar. I know I should know this stuff, but, but if we <laughs> widen the frame, Joe's going to be so proud of me. Then we start to see all this other stuff that's also in the frame. Sorry about all the shakiness. Yeah. But yeah, but literally, um, this notion of how we're, this notion of how we're framed and it's not neutral. How we frame things is not neutral. How we frame things comes from this idea of, and so like there's this, there's this example that I, when uh, we have two kids, they're in their twenties, teens now, late teens. But, um, but when we were, when we were raising them up, it was like, you know, so how do you talk about stuff? And somebody brought up this idea of saying, instead of saying that's green, say that's what we call green because it recontextualizes it as a, as a thing that we're doing. It's not a, this is not green, because once we do that, this is green. And I'm like, all right, so that's green. And there's no options around that. There's no flexibility, there's no, but, but if we say, this is what we call green, we go, oh, cool. So I can either choose to do it like you do it, or I can call it something else, like verde, which is like a different language, because in, in um, Italian, they don't call it green. <laughs> Right, right. And so, so it's this, it's this opening up to possibilities. The idea that um, that, uh, that 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 um, non-neutral specific description is just one option of an infinite number of possible options and descriptions. So, so that that in some ways leads into something else I wanted to ask. I know one of the um, well, you know one of the things that I that I that I took away from. Um, uh, from the material that you presented in, in, in the narrative course uh, that I'm really, you know, it's been really important to me is the relationship between kind of what goes on in the therapy in that kind of therapy relationship, therapy setting, and how that's related to um, activism and community work and, and, and world changing kind of on a, on a, on a different scale uh, outside of the therapy relationship. So I'm curious to ask you, um, your thoughts on the absent but implicit as it comes up in, in activism, in community work, um, in, in changing the world? I, I really appreciate that question. Um, Cause there's, there's one specific thing. Well, I want to say a bunch of different things. One is that there's a, um, there was a weaponization possible in the context of the absent but implicit mm -hmm. where you can say, well, what's absent but implicit in what you're doing is blah, 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 blah. And it's really important that I'm not interested in, in promoting this idea in that way at all. That the only person who can describe what's absent but implicit in my actions is me and you and whoever happens to be talking about what's absent but implicit and what they do. What we do in, with these questions is we, we sort of offer the opportunity to, um, to consider that door. So like if we go back to the door example, 
we might say, is there a door in there? The person says, yeah, and they're the one that's describing what's in that room. It's not us. And so, so first there's that. And I would actually go back to the example too and say that, um, that although there may be something absent but implicit in somebody's abusive actions, they're still responsible for the abuse of those actions. And, to, and the, one of the amazing things about having conversations about what's absent but implicit in the context of abuse is it allows people who participate in abusive actions to go, what's absent but implicit, and this is, I'm making this up, but things like this punk come up. What's yeah. absent but implicit is my, my love and care, my desire to have a different kind of relationship or my desire to try to protect people or keep people safer. And then you can say, okay, so well, so clearly, you know, it's, if this desire to keep people safe is a part of what's absent but implicit in your abusive actions, it's clearly not consistent with what you're doing. And so then that puts that responsibility for the, the, the um, mismatch in the, that action, but that intent right back on the person. And one of the things I love about that in relation to more psych, kind of psychodynamic ideas is that it's not about, you know, you were abused when you were a kid. Okay, that's, 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 but here we are now. And what you're doing to somebody else is something you need to be responsible for. So, so, so let me see if I get this right. A, the absent but implicit um, could could be so someone who participates in abuse, what we would call you know an abuser, uh, would would uh, might be able to discover or or or, or identify um, an absent but implicit uh, desire to to protect and love and cherish. Um, that had previously been been kind of covered up, as opposed to, you know, the the, the other scenario where you could see a, a a therapist wielding subconscious ideas and saying you abuse because of some deficit you have. Um, I mean, it occurs to me that that the the first situation is more interesting and and leads to, in my imagination, at least, way cooler things to talk about than, than the, the deficit one, than the subconscious one. Yeah, and you know, I, I ran, it was either one or two batter's intervention programs that, um, that I've run in, and, and in talking to those guys who come in, so batter, they come in to these batter's intervention programs because they're forced to, they have no interest in doing it, they have to do it in order to kind of get their driver's license back or like whatever it is, it's, um, but. Right. Any one of those guys that I talked to, none of them ever said that violence was something that they wanted to have in relationships. And so, so there, so it's like, what? Yeah. And so then, and so like, if it's, if it's a, well, you know, my controlling is about trying to make sure that I don't get left behind or I don't get lost or I make sure that, that she doesn't do something that would be wrong or, you know, all these ideas like, oh, okay. So, so then, so there's a, a stand that you're taking in relation to these. And so, you know, if you, you want to make sure that um, that you're con you're you're doing this controlling in the relationship because you want to make sure bad things don't happen, and yet the controlling turns out to be a bad thing because of how your partner's experiencing it. So, and what you're doing is you're taking a stand for some kind of intention around safety or even protection of yourself. And so, so how how are you gonna how can you walk that walk um, in a way that doesn't do the exact thing that you're trying not to do? And then it completely undermines the ability that you have permission to keep doing that. It's now, it's now outed as completely inconsistent with what your intentions were in the first place. So you got to take responsibility for the fact that you were doing it. You got to be accountable for the effects that it was having on your partner. I don't know what those are. That person's going to have to make that determination. But there's no, you got no, there's no like, oh, you can keep doing it because you're, you know, your dad beat the shit out of you when you're seven. It's like, all right, that's great. Except this is now. And that sucked for you, right? Yeah. And so now you're doing it to somebody else. And not only is that, and see, so unfortunately, the, what generally batters and adventure programs leave you at is that. Okay, so this happened to you. Now you're doing it to somebody else. Great. Now I feel like a complete jerk. And, I've, and all I'm right. doing is replicating stuff that was destructive for me. But what, what we do with that, some implicit ideas is go, yeah, but there's so there's something manifest in this response to what's going on. And then we can talk about the desire to even keep oneself safe. All right. So, so you have a commitment to safety and to care and concern. Why do you have that? that well, because, you know, when I don't feel safe, it's like this horrible, terrifying, nightmarish thing. Okay. And so I'm pretty sure that your experience of that suggests that you wouldn't want to have somebody else walking through that. Yeah. Well, okay. So you're, you're actually creating that for your partner right now. 
And so, you know, that's so completely inconsistent with this thing that you stand for that you're trying to keep from happening. And so how, you know, so how can you walk down this road in a way that's actually achieving these goals that you have for yourself and for your relationships and your partner? Because apparently doing that isn't working, but it positions it in the context of a stand as opposed to a failure. It positions it in the context of a response to an experience as opposed to just continuing to replicate shit from the past. And so, yeah, and so now this brings us to world changing stuff, right? Because if we can genuinely ask, if you have somebody in your life, and I actually heard this description, you got somebody in your life who's got a, a shaved head and a swastika tattoo on one side and a white supremacist tattoo on the other side. And I don't know, maybe they're the same thing, I, but I'm not familiar enough with the iconography of, of white supremacists to even know. But if instead of going douchebag shithead, don't want to ever see this person again, going, all right, so this is really, not only are do you have some kind of position in relation to Nazis and stuff, but you're like willing to manifest that right on your head. And so I'm curious about what that, what that's about. What is that a stand for? And even if people say it's about the fact that if we don't keep this country white, then I'm not going to be free anymore. Then now we're talking about freedom and we're not talking about this guy is a complete ignorant idiot. We're talking about how this desire for freedom somehow got twisted into the idea that the only way for that to happen is if this country is all white or some idea like that. But, but that's the surface idea. And so that's how we get into these rich description notions. The surface description is that this is a guy, white supremacist, blah, 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 blah. And if we don't ever ask questions into that, we're going to end up in the situation we're in for the rest of our existence. Because one of the things that, that happens with this absent but implicit stuff is we move away from the idea of bad guyifying people. That, that you can't, it, you know, when, when you bad guyify somebody, then you're creating a whole other, and just another group. And these are the bad ones and these are the good ones. Well, what does that sound like? I mean, this white supremacist guy is saying the same thing. The bad ones are the people that have black skin, the good ones are the people that have white skin these surface descriptions we take up these surface descriptions and we end up with borders and prisons and descriptions that have nothing to do with anything other than sort of that first pass this is what this person is but taking the time to say and i you know again i i'll say this if anybody thinks that i'm saying being a white supremacist and and lynching people is a is an okay thing that's not at all what i'm saying what I'm saying is that people are going to keep lynching people until we say, until we ask questions into the idea that how does this seem like a, a reasonable response for you? Because they're going to have answers. How does this seem like a reasonable response? Well, because, in, and I'm just making this stuff up. It's like, unless there's justice, unless people pay for the things that they do, then bad things are going to keep happening. Oh, so, so this is about bad things happening. What kind of bad things are you talking about? Blah, 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 things that's happened. And, and I, you know, unfortunately, the conversations that I've had with, um, with people who are at least described as, as, as uh, racist, I don't know if they're white supremacists or they describe themselves that way. I have a tough time describing other people. I'd like other people to describe themselves, but it's about some sense of fear and worry. And like, like if we don't close off the borders to Mexico, there's going to be this influx of, of drug dealers and rapists. And we don't want drug dealers and rapists in our community. I'm going to, oh, I'm totally down with that. I don't want drug dealers and rapists with, in my community either. How is it that it became, that, that you came to the position that everybody who would come across the border from Mexico is a drug dealer and a rapist? Blah, 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 blah. And what does it say about what you stand for, what matters to you that you don't want drug dealers and rapists in your community? Oh, what kind of a community do you want to have that doesn't have these and so that so those are all these entrees now again you know if you're um if you have gone out and and shot somebody who's coming across the border you got to be accountable for that but the idea that somebody would be so concerned about who's coming across the border that they would take that action that's something that we can ask questions into after the appropriate consequences have been have been meted out for that person then having the conversation. So, so what was it that you were standing for? 
what was it that you were holding dear? Because this is where, and this is where it gets very uncomfortable because you're going to be sitting with a, a guy with a Nazi swastika tattooed on his forehead. And he's always going to start, all of a sudden going to start talking about stuff that you're going, Oh, I understand that. <laughs> I can kind of get with that. And then we got to go, Oh, okay. So it's not that we're all polarized and separated. It's that our, these surface descriptions about who we're supposed to be are polarizing and separating us. And that if we have- say, 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 say that again. It's not, it's not that we're polarized and separated. It's that these surface descriptions about how we're supposed to be, these limiting ideas that say, this is what you are, that small frame that says, this is a guitar and that's all that it is, are polarizing and separating us. And if we take the, uh, if we take the opportunity, every chance we get to go, well, wait a minute, so what is, what, 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 what was that? What was that about? It's like that, what would you just say about your mom, little 10 year old boy? What, what, or what was that? I mean, these guys, you know, the, um, the idea that, that freedom is an extraordinarily important thing for people, that safety and community are things that we stand for. We, we come around to that, that, that the idea of even hate to take up that question. Now it's, this is like, I'm, this is dicey stuff, but these are dicey times people because we're on the precipice here. We have the opportunity to do something that's huge and important, but if we do it the same way we've been doing it, we're going to end up with the same outcome. And so, so pending all the consequences, pending the, the, the just response after all that, to say to somebody, so, um, so, so, where does this? What's this hate about? And it's like, not where does this hate come from? Because that's where I went, went, went. You get into stories in the South and slavery and blah, 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 blah. It's like, it's like to to actually say to somebody, um, why does why does hate seem like a useful response right now? What what is what is it about hate that seems like it's doing something that's useful for you? Because it's not, because if you, and again, I was um, talking to somebody, I can't remember when, about how to engage people in useful conversations. Everybody's not going to be interested in having a conversation. I mean, there are people, and I'm not suggesting that you walk up to a line of people who are identified as white supremacists and Nazis and start getting all curious with them, because that seems like a really dangerous thing to do. But, um, but you will, you may find if, if you're in proximity to somebody, maybe, you know, in a, in a sort of quiet place, someplace else where nobody's really necessarily thinking about what they're talking about, you might hear somebody say something that if you can listen, you can go, uh, what? What did, why, what did you mean by that? Ah, huh, huh. Because for me, and I'm not saying this to anybody else, but for me, the most important thing I think I can do is to find a different way to listen and to stop listening through ears that have been set up by ideas that limit possibilities, that, that go in, this is what we call green, instead of that's green, that's green, that's black, that's white. So, so what you're saying here, it, I think segs into, um, I'm looking at the time, maybe the last question that I have, uh, which is, um, what are, I'll say practices, what are, what are practices that have helped you or that you might recommend to others who want to, um, who want to open the door to the absent but implicit more? Does I think, that make sense? Yeah, yeah, no, no. I, I think that the biggest, um, the biggest thing for me was taking up this notion of, of um, non-neutrality. That, 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 that um, things that people say are neutral, that to take up a note, and this is not about being the word police either, because, you know, I've heard not only is this an old thing, but I've also heard a lot now that, you know, when somebody says people of color instead of black people, take, going, no, oh, dude, you should say black people, wham, wham, this is not, it's, um, it's a waste of time. This is about, this is about being, somebody says something and taking up this notion that it's, that it's not neutral, that there's, there's energy to it, there's possibilities to it, there's consequences to it, and just this continual 
I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. And I said this a million times, the most important thing that I got from getting a doctorate had to do with me being willing to say, I don't have any idea how to do that. I don't have any idea what you're talking about. What are you talking about? What does that word mean? I don't even know what you're talking about. And to be like in this curious, open, I don't have to know the answers to everything kind of place, which gets me in this, oh, oh, huh. And literally when somebody says a word going, oh, so what, um, what, do, you, what do you mean by that word? I'm familiar with, with that word in the context of this, but I'm, I don't really know. When you talk about hope, I'm not really sure. Or when you talk about helping, I'm really interested in, in, um, in what you mean by helping. And, and the other thing is to be thinking about, like when somebody says help, I get into this whole agenda about help being this uh, hierarchical blah, blah thing. And yeah. so the idea, of, of also being kind of coming back to my own agendas and my own kind of preconceived yeah. notions about how I hear things that I have, that I hear. Um, but it's, it's, I think really it's that non-neutrality idea that was yeah, really yeah. huge for me. Okay, yeah. Yeah, I could see if you, you know, uh, um, pre presuming or, or, or assuming that uh, non-neutrality when you experience what other people are saying and doing, it, it sounds like it necessarily then turns into presuming non-neutrality on the things that I'm saying and that I'm doing, um, and that you know, and if it's something that I'm doing or do, you know, that, then then that's the realm where I can open the door to the absent, but implicit in my own life. Like you had said earlier, you know, you you, you can't um, you can't assume what's absent but implicit for someone else, but I can do it for me. Yeah, well, that sounds really helpful. Well, thank you very much. Um, do you, to close the interview, is, is, um, is there anything else that you would like to say about absent and implicit that didn't get said that would, wouldn't take too many minutes? <laughs> no. Okay. No, no, I think I'm, I'm, I'm just really grateful to have had this conversation and cause just like with the absent but implicit, you know, having the opportunity to talk about ideas, just creates more possibilities. And, yeah, you know, yeah, it's got yeah. me thinking about stuff that I wasn't thinking about before. Good. And, and so, yeah, yeah so likewise. that kind of that perpetual kind of opening and widening the frame, what Joe McGeary talks about, um, that we can do that. That we can. It's an invitation. Absent but implicit is an. In Here's the thing. <laughs> absent but implicit is an invitation. It's a hey, but what about this? What about instead of just instead of just focusing on surface descriptions, if we were to be in a position where every time somebody says something, that just creates more possibilities. It's like every time somebody says a word, the confetti cannon goes off and, well, what about all these things? And, <laughs> well, what about all these things? And, and it's like, you know, this like- I, my I was just thinking, you know, you know, <laughs> I w I, if we had the time, I would ask for a nice succinct metaphor, but I think you just handed it to me. <laughs> The Pee Wee Herman <laughs> word of the day confetti cannon. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And it all starts some some other set of possibilities. So yeah. Thank you very much, man. I'm so proud of you. <laughs> well, thank you. I'm proud of me too. <laughs> Good. So, so I'm gonna stop the recording. <laughs>